I'd like to welcome you back here for the second week of our Job Bible study uh, called Trusting God's Plan and Not Your Own. I'm going to check my watch here to make sure the pastor doesn't go too awful long here. All right, so I've got that. Now, if you recall from last week, uh, what we did is we read the first last week, I'm sorry, two days ago. Wow. Uh, if you recall from Monday, uh, we were taking a look here at Job and we looked at the first 12 verses and there was this contest that was set up uh, between Satan and between God. Where Satan, you remember the word means accuser. And he came before God with an accusation towards Job. And the accusation is the only reason that Job loves you is because you've made his life the good life, the easy life. But once his life goes bad, and again, the accuser, he will curse you. All right, so there we have that. Now, the other interesting thing about this, and I didn't touch on this as much as I wanted to on Monday, was that God was the one who offered Job up. Satan came and God was the one who said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, have you looked at this guy over here? And in many ways, I was thinking it's a lot like uh, Jesus' temptation in the desert. You know, he was there for 40 days, but what we often forget is that the Spirit led Jesus out into the desert. A time of testing. And that testing as unpleasant as tests are, testing can be a blessing from God to strengthen us, to show us exactly where we're at with our relationship with him. Are we really trusting God's plan and not our own? All right, so that a little bit of context here, or a little reminder of where we are. Uh, and so we'll get to today's Bible study, Job 1, starting at verse 13 on your sheet. You're going to read through uh, our lesson for today. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And when the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are all dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. You've heard of having a bad day. This might be the worst day of all time. I, I mean, again, we all have days, but seriously, one after another, a person shows up and gives Job what you'd start with bad news and ends up with the worst news of all. Your sons and daughters were eating in a house and the house has collapsed upon them and they are dead. So now remember the test. How is Job going to respond? And so let me take you down to verse 20 here uh, so we can see this. What does Job do? Then Job arose, tore his, rose, and tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. A lot of us Remember this from the King James, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, so let's take a look at our Bible study questions here. And the Bible study is going to be divided into two parts in many ways, and we'll see how far we get in our allotted time today. But our two parts we're going to look at is, okay, now we have to look at this from the perspective of heaven, all right? 
Um, not just Job is sad or Job is angry or what Job's reaction is, but what does this say about Job's relationship with God? All right, so you have to have the heavenly perspective that was set up in the first 12 verses to fully understand this, all right? Because you can be angry, you can be sad, you can have a variety of emotions, you can even be happy. But what, does the, what do these things say about where your relationship is with God, okay? So you have to remember that. That's the key thing that we're looking for when we look uh, at Job and what he had to say and what he did. All right, so let's take a look here. Number one, what did Job do? And the second part that I was going to say is, what did Job not do? That's going to be today's Bible study. What did he do in relation to God and what did he not do? All right, number one, what did Job do in all the tragic news? Well, you take a look here and there's two parts in verse 20. One, he tore his robe, a sign of sadness, anguish, and then also humility, all right, um, that you have. It's sometimes a sign of repentance before God, that he is a servant in God's hand no matter what. Job is honest. It's not like Job is up and down, like jumping up and down in happiness. That's not it. Of course not. That would be crazy. But you also know he fell to the ground. Again, in humility, in worship, that he was still able to say this. I came into the world with nothing. In other words, in his words, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, and yet blessed be the name of the Lord. One of the best confessions of faith that uh, I have heard, I one time had a uh, a woman who was telling me about a lot of terrible things that happened in uh, her life, and uh, she was really in a, a dark and, and sad place. And she just simply was able to still say, God is good. Three words. God is good. In the midst of all those things that were going on in her life, God is good. That is a confession of faith in three words. A beautiful one, I might add. And you take a look at Job in much the same way. He goes a little bit deeper, talking about how the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But either way, everything's in the Lord's hand. But to be able to say in the midst of this, God is good. I don't like what happened. I don't understand what happened. You don't, you don't see Job asking at this point, at least at this point, why you're making accusations towards God. He just makes a confession of faith. So you take a look at this, and the next question I had is, what was Satan hoping Job would do? Well, I think we know that. Satan already said it. He was hoping that Job would be so overcome with anger and despair, these sorts of things, that he would curse God. You know, all these things, God, I'm done with you. How could you let this happen? God you know, you are rotten, you're not really good, you're evil, all of these things that can run through our hearts, sometimes through our mouths, and even be displayed in our lives. But Satan did not get that reaction. Then you take a look here at my second question. I asked, how did Job understand all the things that he had in his life and why he had, um, uh, why he had all those good things in the first place? Okay, um, well, Everything came from God. Uh, the Lord gave, again, in three words. It's all from the Lord. Everything he had. In number three follows at this third question I asked, how did this make a difference in his reaction to the loss? I mean, take a look. How do we understand the things in our lives? Well, I earned that. I worked for that. You know, that was my doing. Uh, you know, these things, you know, credit to me. But you notice Job didn't say anything like, I earned it, or all my hard savings, or the wisdom of my investments led me to this point. Nothing like that. Instead, take a look here at a couple other verses I put down under question three. 
1 Timothy 6, 6-7. Of course, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and neither can we carry anything out of it. That old saying that he who dies with the most toys wins. Like life is a contest to get the most material things. You know, and you take a look, even things like not just materials, but sometimes it's likes in social media or friends or these sorts of things, whatever it is. And yet we're reminded here that we didn't bring anything with us into the world. And thus everything that we have truly is a gift from God. And then another verse here from Luke chapter 12, verse 15. <laughs> I've always liked this verse quite a bit. It's something that Jesus said. He said, watch out. And I've always found that to be kind of interesting. You know, watch out. You know, kind of like, I don't know, there's a rock flying at your head. Uh, this is a golf course. It's Jesus yelling for uh, something like this. Like, watch out. And you're like, what, what am I supposed to watch out for? What, what, what's coming my way? And he says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Oh, it's not something physical, but it's something that can wreck my soul. I have to have things. If I don't, I'm not a success. If I don't have these things, I won't be happy. And then Jesus said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That's not life. And so I'm just checking my watch real quick here. You can see me do this to make sure. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? The pastor can actually check his watch and like watch the time. Just for the record, that'll never happen during a sermon. There, you're as long, as long as I, you're stuck as long as I talk. That's just how it is. <laughs> but for today's Bible study, it really is going to be 15 minutes. All right. So you see this here, though, our life. And take a look at Job's life. Part of his reaction is how he first understood everything in his life. It's not for me. It's a gift. Everything I have. You can kind of think of uh, the end of the uh, Luther's first, uh, uh, Luther's explanation to the first article of the creed. Do you remember? All this, meaning the things in our life, all this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in us. It's all a gift of grace. All that stuff, the daily bread that God provides. And that makes a difference in how we respond when those things are with us, praising God, thanking him each day, and when those things are gone, that I trust in God. And I'm going to thank and praise him for the things I still do have and know that he is going to provide for me for each day ahead. And you look at Job, trusting in God's plan and not his own. I should also mention very relevant today, where we live in a time of not just uncertainty with health, but certainly there's a lot of economic uncertainties for a lot of people today. And the call to trust in God's plan that he will provide. Then take a look here at number four. I'm just going to take a look at a, a few of these as I come down to my last couple of minutes. Number four, where we talked about what J did Job do. And there's some observations of his faith. And just kind of look at them. And my question is, which one strikes you for your walk with the Lord? God, Job could say, was in control of his life. And no matter what the immediate source of adversity uh, or tragedy was, it had to pass through the loving and wise hands of God before it could touch him. That it wasn't just something bad happened. This is terrible. But Job was understanding the bad things in context of his relationship with God. Or here's another one. God was worthy to be blessed and praised in any and all circumstances of life. You might recall the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, um, where you get, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, and a lot of those are not overly positive, and yet we're blessed in the hands of God 
in all the circumstances of life. And even when you get to the end of that section, chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 11 and 12, blessed are those who insult you and persecute you. What? Rejoice and be happy, Jesus says. What? And he says, because great is your reward in heaven. That again, you have to understand the suffering in your relationship with God. So finally, I'm going to take you down uh, to the bold print in the middle of the second side of the, the page, and I'll kind of pick it up here next time. Um, take a look at this here, kind of a summary point. Through chapter 1, all right, it says, In this, Satan was utterly disappointed, because he found a man who loved his God more than his earthly portion. He, meaning Satan, had been so often successful in this kind of temptation that he made no doubt that he should succeed again. I mean, this worked so many times for Satan. <laughs> take away the treasure, take away the good things, people will curse God. It works! Hey, all the stuff that makes me me, all those earthly things, you know, if Satan can take those things away, hey, that means God's bad and I curse it. But not Job, not here. And so again, trusting in God's plan, and not his own, not our own, not your own. And with that, again, email your questions in if you have them, pdare at zionalex.org, and I will see you on Friday.